Kathy. <laughs> Amen. Want to stay up, does it? It knows I'm getting used to these new glasses. It keeps trying to get away so I can see better. Strength for today and 
bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Amen. Would be anybody else have a special song? You got Kathy's got one here. music here. Uh, while she's coming down, we'll go ahead and make our upcoming announcements. Uh, again, our fall festival is October the 22nd. Uh, don't forget on Wednesday night we'll be meeting in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, and also remember our Kids Connection. And uh, for our prayer tonight, we have, again, the long list of names that we have. I'm going to review some of the ones that we got earlier this morning. Uh, Miranda Payne, Justin Green had several requests that he made known there yesterday. Uh, let's remember little Declan. Doris, uh, Anthony uh, request. Dolores' daughter, let's remember her. Patsy, uh, Joyce Evans and her family. Uh, 
we've got several other names here that I'd like to remember as well. Jamie Eli, again, Dolores and Bob, Maggie Bennett, sister and brother, Janice Hatfield, Beth, Charlie, and Danny Cooper. Remember Hazel, she's going tomorrow for her, hopefully we'll get her in at the doctorate to get some results. Brother Mike, Debbie, their son and daughter, Jeff Ford and family, uh, Debbie's co-worker and her, co her office manager, Melinda during her traveling, uh, Alex's dad and family, uh, and Melinda's friend that's in the hospital. And as she said, we've got good report on her, so let's continue to remember her as well. Anybody else? All right. Those that will, let's all come on into the altar and let's take it to the Lord in prayer tonight. Amen. May I have the men up for the evening offering, please? <laughs> Brother Bob. Amen. I'm supposed to ask, Brother Bobby, you got a message tonight? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Come on up, Brother. <laughs> Amen. Telling you say something one time and it never leaves you, does it? Well, let's turn our Bibles back to the book of Romans, chapter number 8. Beginning in verse number 38. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Fathers, we bow before you thanking you so much for the opportunity as we assemble ourselves together to worship and praise the Lord Jesus Christ. God, we pray for this message, we pray for the power of God. Lord, we pray for the words to say, the message of the hour. God, we pray that you search our hearts here <coughs> as we gather this day. 
Lord, we love you and we thank you. And Lord, way we thank you for the sweet spirit and the good service that we had this morning. And Father, I pray you'll search our hearts out tonight. You know what we stand in need of. And we'll be so very careful to give you all the praise, the honor, the glory for it all. For it's in Christ Jesus' precious holy name we do pray. And amen. <coughs> in verse number 38, I preach for I am persuaded that. Then I preach neither death. The very first thing that Paul deals with is the thing that we, the enemy that we dread the most. And it seems like death is the one thing that does separate. It separates families, separates humanity. It, it just seems to separate death from life. But we don't have to worry about that because for a Christian, death brings you closer to God, not farther away. He said, and, and he said, don't worry about even life. And life can be really hard. Life can be a struggle sometimes. I, while some people are just happy with, with their life and the way things are going, you got others, they're miserable. Their marriage might be bad. Kids might be prodigal. Health might be bad. Uh, circumstances, and you just dread life. And it can overwhelm people after so long of putting up with something that that is trying to take the happiness and joy away from you till you just finally give up on life. And God and what Paul's saying, don't give up on life because God's love is still there even though you might be miserable. God is still with you. His part in your life doesn't make us miserable. He is sometimes the only peace, the only joy, the only uplift that we have when everything else seems to be falling apart or something's falling apart. Thank God we never have to worry about the love of God growing cold. And so he's saying death won't separate you, life won't separate you, and not even angels. And I got started on preaching about the angels this morning about how that the young boy and how a demon possessed this man's boy even when he was a toddler till he was a teenager and his dad had to deal with that that boy trying to kill himself that boy throwing it demon throwing him in the fire throwing him in the water and that dad is a 24 hour day now the bible never mentions the mother in that but the daddy he carried a load of that thing he had it up on himself there could have been a wife there could have been a mom she may have had all she could take and just left it all up to him but thank God one day that daddy came before Jesus brought that boy with that demon and God cast him out what I'm saying is this is that the worst circumstance you could ever imagine God's love was still right in the middle of it and all we have to do is persevere until that day where God meets that need that we have and takes care of it. I don't know what form it is, but whatever form it is in your life tonight, if you've been carrying it around, if it's been a part of that, if it's been a struggle, if you've tried to distance, if you've tried to stop, if you're trying to fix it, if you're trying to get it out and remove it from your life and you're struggling and you ain't had it yet, may I remind you that you're in the right place tonight because this is God's house my God showed up this morning he's here in the midst tonight I can feel him in my spirit this night and whatever it is that you find yourself as part of your life whether it be the angels whether it be the devils whatever it may be my God is here for you tonight and this could be the very time that you and God meet at the same place at the same time and he fixes that thing that you're dealing with he not only said, but the angels, if he did it for him, he'll do it for you. And you got to understand, what about the demoniac at Gadara, a legion of angels in him? They had him in a place where he didn't think he could get help. Nobody came to his aid. All they wanted to do in Gadara was to ch chain him up, keep him out away from everybody else. But one day God sailed through a storm, walked up on that bank, cast those demons out, put clothes on him, put him in his right mind, made him part of who he was, brought him into the family of God, gave him a job, kept his home and put him back in a home. So what God is trying to say, if you're going through demonic and spiritual influence that's negative and critical to who you are and who you are in Jesus Christ, don't you worry. God knows all about that. He is on his way. Amen. But now I want to get to this part right here is the fact is, hey, you ever thought about something? Thought just hit me. 
Angels, do you suppose they have conversations? None of us has ever heard an angel speak, have we? But I know of a man, I'm preaching what he wrote. He'd been to heaven in front of God three different times. He's been surrounded by the angels. I don't know if he could hear Michael and Gabriel talk. I don't know if he's in the presence of God and the angels, if he heard the conversations going on. But could you imagine if you think it's good when me and you talk about the goodness of Almighty God and one day heaven's going to be our home? Can you imagine what it'd be like to hear the angels that are surrounded by God in heaven? heaven all the time and what the things that's going on into heaven I'd love to hear an angel conversation and just to talk about what goes on in heaven that we don't even know about but now let me get on to the preaching part he said principalities that's wicked rulers we've experienced that at this church COVID restrictions y'all remember they said shut the doors you can't go worship Open the doors wide at the Walmart, but don't you go to church. Make sure the hairdo places are open because you got to look good while you're not worshiping. Y'all better get the amen in some of that. Got to keep the bars open because if you can't have the Holy Spirit, you got to have the bottle spirit. You ever notice that some in places that sells liquor and wine that says spirits, they ain't lying about none of that. I've seen people under the influence of bottled spirits. One and a half honest men in this whole church. Yep, we've heard that too. Amen. But it's principalities. It's when we, we in, the, in the country that we live in, and they're now trying to make this Bible a hate book. It's a book of love. It's God's love toward humanity. What they don't like is the fact that God's book says that what they're doing is a sin that it's wrong. They don't like that part. This ain't a hate book whatsoever. It ain't a hate speech to preach against sin. The Bible even said God hates sin, but he don't hate the sinner. So now when we're dealing with principalities, God says it's getting pretty bad. When they try to censor a Bible-preaching preacher and a pastor behind the pulpit on what you can and can't say. Amen. Yep. And I can tell you the truth. The one person that I really care about, whether they like what I'm preaching or not, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as long as I'm lined up with his word, I'm good to go. It's the people you're looking at don't always like it. Almost two amens out of that. Three, oh, y'all are coming on board now. But nobody likes to be told they're, what they're doing is wrong, now do they? I don't like it, you don't like it. Well, imagine, uh, imagine a lost wicked person. They especially don't like it. And what really hurts is trying to preach the Word of God against things that are wrong is when you got the people doing the preaching that are just as wrong as they are. Amen. Amen. It's one of them things. There ain't no such thing as a secret sin, not in America, not in Campbell County, and not in a small Baptist church. Because I don't care who you are, somebody knows your business. So Paul said, when it comes against principalities, it's those that, you know, say we can't have the Ten Commandments on government bills. I've preached this so much, but I'm figure one more time won't hurt none of us. Amen. They try to wipe away the Ten Commandments because it says thou shalt not. Nobody likes the thou shalt nots, do they? Nobody wants to say but one true and living God, and he is the judge of everybody. And when you walk into a courtroom, could you imagine you hear one of the things that's just went on just recently about that crazy person walking into that daycare and shooting all them little babies and toddlers while they was asleep? Do you see that kind of world that we live in? 
and the principalities are saying, you cannot stand and say what thus saith the Lord because it might upset, it might offend. You can't preach that Jesus is the only true and living God, the only risen Savior, because them that worship the other false gods in this world, it might offend them. And you can't preach that he's the only God. But may I tell you right now, he is the only God. There ain't no other God can save you, no other God defeated death, hell, and the grave. No other God got up from the dead and raised back again, and that wasn't good enough for him. He opened up the graves on that third and appointed day. He is one he, he you can't limit God. But what they're saying is this it might offend some of these other folks that think that they've got their other God, that there's more than one way to heaven, that there's more than one God. They ain't but one God. His name is Jesus. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. He rose up from the grave. He sits on the right hand of the Father and the principality is to try to say you can't preach that you can't believe that you got to be tolerant no I don't neither do you he said when the principalities and it seems like the world's turning against the church and turning against Christ and turning against you and me he said don't you worry about it because the love of God is right in the middle of all that then he goes on to say, not just with principalities, I'm just giving you, I'm just kind of giving you the highlights of some of this. Because I go back to a man named Daniel. Do you know what the big thing about Daniel was? Not only did he have to fight the spiritual powers that were against him when it took 21 days after he prayed, God heard the prayer, but it took 21 days for God to get back to him because all the fallen angels that were between him and his answer is the fact is that they told him it was illegal to pray. Don't you ever pray. There ain't no God but this king. You go, Darius is the only one. You can't pray anymore. There ain't no other God than him. And Daniel looked at that. He just kind of threw that back behind him. And what was the first thing he did? He was praying three times a day openly and publicly. And he said, I'm going to tell you about my God. I ain't nobody, whether it be a king, whether it be a bunch of pencil pushers, whether it be a bunch of politicians, politicians nobody's going to tell me that I can't bow my head and pray before my holy God he's worthy to be praised amen if they can stand in a public place and let somebody pray to a false God that's only a part of their imagination don't tell me we can't pray to our holy God thank God we can pray anytime anywhere we want to and so when principalities tell you you can't pray they don't even want you bowing your head and asking God's blessing at a meal. And you're paying for it. And chances are you're tipping somebody. You can give them all the money in your pocket, but you can't pray to the Holy God. It might offend somebody in the restaurant. God forbid. Let me tell you, at the great white throne judgment, there's going to be an awakening there. Let me just preach on. Nor powers. Powers are those suggestions. Do you ever notice how the devil likes to work? He just wants to lead you just enough to try to lead you by your own will. It's like, it's like trying to go to a car dealership and asking the salesman, should you buy this car? That's the easiest sale he's ever had. Yeah, that's the one you need. Then they'll sell you $24,000 worth of warranties on it. And cars are, if it wasn't for plastic, they couldn't make a car. They're like big lighters. They're disposable. People don't even work on them anymore. Throw them away. Let me go ahead. i got to get back to preaching. That powers is suggestions. It's the sinful flesh. It's the devil that puts thoughts in our head. It's the TV and the movies. Have you seen what, uh, what Hollywood has done to God and to the church? They've mocked him. They've shamed him. they put him on the same level as some kind of an idiot. They think all the Jim Joneses and David Koresh's and others that are self-proclaimed messiahs that they put my God on the same level as them they're imitators they're they're anti-christ they ain't but one god of this world and that's the lord jesus christ amen. amen and he says when you see that and god knows we're right in the middle of it 
Don't you worry, God's love still abounds. I'm working my way up to preaching. Just stay with me. It's when the, we live in a time where the wicked go into schools and thank God it's not here that I know of, but around this country. And they're telling these toddlers in pre-K and first grade and second grade and third grade, you're not really a boy, you're not really a girl, you're whoever you think you are, even though the Bible says and the parents say, by God made male and he made female, you fit into one of them two categories. There ain't no third category. It's not what you think or what somebody suggests you are bless God you're a boy you're a girl that's why we got blue and we got pink we got male we got female but don't worry God's love still abounds right in the midst of all that but he known only that it's when the wicked teach and it's when the upper learning the colleges of this godly nation. And I will say, yes, it's still a godly nation. Don't you think it just what you see on the 6 o'clock news is how all of America is? It is not. We still got more than a remnant of people that love God and believe God and believe this blessed book that show up in the house of God every Sunday and raise that hand up in defiance of the wicked and say, I'm here to worship one true and living risen God. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't care how many times you tell me I can't, the more this country tries to erase any mark of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it be his Ten Commandments, whether it be his cross, whether it be his nativity, seen whether it be his name the more God saves and the more God blesses I know we don't have as many in here tonight as we did this morning but if you were here this morning thank God we had a baptizing of a young man that said I love God no matter what of a family that said I want a Bible believing church I want to know I've been to church and not some entertainment when I go to the house of God I want the songs of praise to be sung I want the Bible to be preached I want to feel the presence of God, amen. Thank God we still got people in this country that still believe that message. But it's the powers. You see, it's when you got an ungodly government that says, well, we're going to make a way where there is no way. Sixty million little babies murdered in the tombs of, in the wombs of their mother. Yes, it might as well be the tombs of their mother that are now saying, you can murder that little baby right up till the day that they give birth and even partial birth. They have no love for God. They have no love for children. They've got no love of what's holy and what's right. But thank God right into the middle of that, God has shown his love. Thank God there's still those who don't go that route thank God there's still those that'll raise a sign and a Bible and say it ain't right what you're doing and thank God when them little babies are murdered in the wombs of their mothers we've got a holy God that has sent an angelic escort that'll get hold of every little baby that's not had the opportunity to live and to thrive and to grow up and to get saved and to worship God takes them to heaven anyway he's got a nursery up there he's got the best babysitter that you'd ever have he say he has actually saved him from things and wickedness back into this world the devil can't touch them in heaven they'll never be abused in heaven thank god he made a way for him because his love abounds in the midst of all that the wicked influence that's the power what about the things that are present you ever realize that the present day that we live in is some of the most wicked times this world has ever seen? It's when you're going through dangers and personal troubles. It's one thing to see it on the 6 o'clock news. It's one thing when it's a neighbor down the road. It's one thing when it's in a different state or a different country. But when danger and trouble comes to your house and gets in the middle of your life and tries to disrupt your family, then it's a whole nother thing. Now you're the one that's dealing with what somebody else had to deal with before. What I'm telling you is this, is that the 
things that are present. Sometimes the danger shows up, and sometimes you've got to deal with a whole lot of things that you never thought you'd ever have to deal with. And in the midst of your suffering, and the midst of your storm, and in the midst of your valley, you're going to find that the love of God is still there. Everybody that shows up in the house of God doesn't mean everything's going right. Doesn't mean everything's good with you. Doesn't mean you didn't carry burdens in with you. Doesn't mean that you ain't got a struggle in your personal life. But thank God that through everything like that, you see yourself in the house of God. You're sitting in a church pew and you can feel the same spirit of that family that ain't going through what you're going through because God said, I'm going to bless you if you'll just come, if you'll just trust, if you'll just be here. I'll pour the same blessing out on you as I pour out on everybody else. Thank God no matter what we're going through in our present life, we still got a God that'll bless us on the top of it. Amen. Amen. He said, don't you worry about whatever you're going through, whatever the present thing is. You could be here broken hearted. I mean, you li we live in a time where there's so much influence on our kids and our grandkids. This world has become anti-Jesus. They're trying to offer different ways. They're just trying to cut him out. But lay, I tell you what, they've been trying to erase the name of Jesus. They've been trying to shut him down for 2,000 years. They've been trying to wipe him out. They've been trying to take away any opportunity. But may I tell you right now church in this church service tonight and the fact that my God is still just as much a God as he has always been he's still saving the lost he's still blessing the saved he's still making a way where there is no way my God is still showing up and he's still showing out and I don't know about you but in this wicked world I'm still blessed God just as blessed when I come to the house of almighty God I still have the same great God he's the God that walks throughout Israel. He's the God that cast out the demons. He's the God that stills the storms. He's the God that saved the lost. He's the great shepherd that went through the valley of the shadow of death. My God is still the same God. Amen. Amen. He said, don't you worry about it. You see, we've got protesters and we've got murderers running free and the governments give them a free pass. We've got churches that are under all kinds of attack. We've got all kinds of children that are being tempted away from God and their families. We've got all kinds of protesters and murderers and they're killing Christians and it doesn't seem to bother the people that are in charge. But thank God right into the midst of that, I feel love do you not do you not know tonight that my God and your God loves you this night don't you know he still makes he still gives us our daily bread he still blesses us right in the midst of our turmoil thank God for Jesus Christ tonight Amen. nor things to come you see this is a man that had been through everything and he's looking ahead he might say, you know, even I don't know what's around the bend. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. I don't know what I'm going to face. It could be the best day of my life. It could be the worst day of my life. But he said there's something that we don't even know. It may show up in the very morning. He's, what he's talking about is it's the fear of the future. How many people, I mean, that, that old boy, wish I could think of his name. It was Ted something or another. He owned the Atlanta Braves and owned that. Ted Turner, thank you. That old boy, he said, he said, I fear for the world. We got way too many people. The world can't sustain it. The world, he's an atheist. He's in hell right now. He, and he said, the world can't support this many people. They're just way too many people. And he was, he was all for getting rid of some of them. And I may tell you something about the fact is that all the Ted Turners of this world, they ain't got to worry about it. My God can feed this many and way many more than this. You ain't got to worry about the, about the future, about what comes anymore. Don't you worry about the future. If you'll read this blessed book, the future is this. There's a great tribulation on its way. It's going to show up any time. And before that happens, there is a rapture that has been promised. We're going to miss the great tribulation. We're going to be up in heaven. They're going to have hell upon earth, down upon this earth. At the end of it, we're coming back on white horses. We're going to set up a kingdom with the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll rule and reign with him as kings and priests on this earth while the wicked are subject unto us and unto the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Don't fear the future. I just told you what it was, amen. amen, from the Word of God. 
But he says, don't fear the future. Because even things, even time, even the future is not enough to separate us from the love of God. Do you worry about that? The, the governments and society are going to fall apart. Do you hear what I'm saying? You've got the Democrats fighting the Republicans. One side tells a story. The other side's the devil. The other side tells a story. That side's the devil. All of them are, are trying to say they ain't nothing but thieves and liars. And what I'm telling you is this, is that neither Republican nor, nor Democrat has got the answer. They ain't nothing. If Jesus Christ was running for politics and whether it be the White House or any other position, he'd be the only one I would vote for because he is the only one that has the answers that we're looking for. But thank God he's not into politics. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's going to rule all this anyway when he comes back with his church. He don't have to run for office. He's got the highest office in the land. The President of the United States would pale in comparison to the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back a raid and finally and thank God on a white horse you see everything's going to fall apart the countries are in chaos crime can you not agree that crime is rampant in this country you see the things to come. Nobody feels safe anymore. But thank God I've got a God that surrounds me with his nail-scarred hands. I've got a God that's got more angels than anybody could ever count. A calculator couldn't keep up with them. And God sends his angels. They're on the other side of me. They're surrounding you right now. They might not be seen with the eye, but they are here nonetheless. Things that are about to come. I'm preaching the highlights. I ain't even preaching all this. Nor height. Have you ever thought about the height? I don't know why Paul brought that up. But if you think about the height, it could be the accomplishments that we think. What is it? Somebody wants to be famous. Somebody wants to do what nobody's ever done. People think they've achieved heights. If they get in a SpaceX rocket, pay about for so many million dollars, and they go up into outer space for about 10 minutes, and it brings them down. My God, I've rode rides at King Island last more than that. That's right. If somebody can invent something that's never been invented, somebody can make more money than somebody else made, They're, that's reached their heights. But nobody has ever reached the heights until they've got saved by God's amazing grace and filled with the Spirit of God. On the Mount of Transfiguration, God gave them what Peter, James, and John just a little taste. He showed them what was on the other side. He showed them what a glorified body looks like. He showed them that Moses who was born and came through the grave. He showed them Elijah that was taken in a rapture. He gave them the heights. It couldn't possibly get any better if you want to know anything about the future that Peter, James, and John was a Allowed to see what was on the other side but God has done that and he's done so much more hey see what mountains do is that mountains separate they separate people they separate countries <coughs> they separate things if you remember oh Elijah on top of the uh, greatest victory God ever gave him on top of Mount Carmel he was sudden they had been in a three and a half year drought he got some barrels of water he built an altar out of 12 stones he he mocked those Jezebel's false prophets. Maybe you ought to talk a little louder. Maybe he's gone on an adventure. Maybe he's asleep. He made fun of them and then he killed them with the sword. But he looked down at Israel and he said, Before I ever pray this one prayer and settle this matter for good, you all need to make your mind up. You see, the one most dangerous place you and I don't ever want to be is straddling a fence. Either you love God and God is your God or God is not your God. God. If Jesus is your Savior or He's not, there ain't no middle ground. He told Israel, you need to get off the fence, make up your mind who you're going to serve this day. Called fire down from heaven that licked up all the water, that licked up the sacrifice, and He had the greatest victory in His pr prophetic career on top of Mount Carmel. Somewhere or another, God has given you and me a great victory. Amen. So he said, when you get to the heights of what you've done in your life, what about Mount Ararat? We've been teaching on that. 
And Mount Ararat is where the ark settled in East Turkey. And you're going to find that that mountain was a new beginning. The only foundation that ark found or ever will rest upon is the top of the mountains in Mount Ararat. But it was God who wanted to wipe out humanity and everything that breathed. Just let it go back to him and the angels. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. God doesn't need us, but he desires us. We need him. And so he made a way for eight souls to escape the flood. After almost a year, they, that ark settled on top of Mount Ararat, and the water subsided finally, and they got a new beginning. You see, the mountains can be a place of a new beginning. But what happened? And God gave them an opportunity to follow him and teach their kids and their grandkids and their great-great-grandkids. But what happened? Have you watched the 6 o'clock news? Have you got out of your front yard? Have you looked and seen even in Campbell County have you seen what's going on in this country and in this world man has got wicked all over again but he said don't let you don't let that bother you because you see a mountain can also be the biggest accomplishment we'd ever had do you know about Abraham and Isaac when he's God said I want you to sacrifice your only son for burnt offering Man, they took a three-day journey to that big mountain, but somewhere on the inside of that, 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 that daddy, who's already over 100 years old, he know the words God spoke to him, sacrifice, burn his body. But there was something on the inside of that man that knew that he was coming back down off that mountain with that boy. And you can't get no more, you can't get no more serious, no more of a serious circumstance as when God himself tells you to sacrifice the son of promise, your only son between you and Sarah. And he told him, he said, you sacrifice him. And somewhere the, the, the spirit of God began to speak to his heart. I know what words he said, but I also know there's something else happening. Happening. I know that when we go on top of that mountain, we're coming back down. We're going to worship. And exactly like he believed in the words that he said, what I'm trying to tell you is this. You might carry the worst day, the worst burden, the worst time of your life once you get on top of that mountain. But thank God somewhere on that mountain, you're going to find a victory in your life that you did not see coming. He didn't know about the ram. He didn't know about anything else. He just knew inside his heart is that that boy was coming back down with him he'd be very much alive he'd be walking on his own two feet he didn't know how God was going to do it and what I'm telling you is this is that sometimes we have to reach higher than what we've ever reached before we have to go places we had never tried to go we have to let our faith take us where it's never taken us before if we're ever going to reach the heights that God has planned for us had he not went on top of that mountain he would have never known the true authority and the true power that God had in his life sometimes we just got to climb the mountain but he says this well Jesus was lifted high on the cross was he not nor depth you know what death means it means depression and mystery we've all experienced depression in some form have we not if it's nothing more than a bad day, if it's nothing more than being overwhelmed by what we're going through, that is more than what we can handle. And it's that time that we realize that that burden has drove us to our knees until the time we turn it over to God and God lifts that burden from us. It's a mystery how long we're going to carry that until God takes it from us. And so what he's saying is when you reach into the depths, it's depression and it's mystery and it's because of events unknown. Nobody in this church and nobody on Facebook knows what we're going to face in the next hour. We don't know if tomorrow is going to bring good or if it's going to bring bad. 
It's when you're in that place. And I don't know if you've experienced this or not, but if you're old enough to remember the Great Depression, it's in whatever that you do. It could be a bad investment. It could be that putting your money in the stocks and the bonds. It could be the fact that you've got it saved up. It could be whatever it is, whatever form that it comes in. But you've ever lost everything that you've ever worked for. You've got no way to buy food, no way to buy. I mean, you could just lose a house in the day's economy that we live in and you could find yourself homeless they've come and got your car they've kicked you out of the house you've got no insurance you've got no way to buy food you've got no way to put yourself in a home anywhere and get yours out of the shelter this country and even this county is is overwhelmed with homeless people that got no tomorrow to look forward to that's got no way to get theirself out of the situation they find theirself in it's not always drugs it's not not always alcohol it's not always a mind problem and sometimes the fact is that everything that you've got has been taken from you Amen. and you find yourself in a position that you can't even help yourself that's been the depths is it not it's happened in america since there's been in america people put all their effort and time into trying to get ahead only to have circumstances or crookery I don't know if crookery is a real word or not, but it seems to fit. You ever notice today they had one of all watched it on the news. One of the poorest countries in the entire world, East Africa. They ain't even got a job, but they got a computer. And no boys on there talking about, I guess catfish is the word I'm looking for. I don't really know, but it's when they pretend to be somebody that they ain't. And some lonely person falls in love with him. And she gave this guy 200 and something thousand dollars. Yeah, oh. Because what I'm trying to tell you, there's always a thief out there trying to get what you've got. Amen. Let me go ahead and preach on because I'm just about done. It's depression, it's mystery, it's when you've lost everything that you've ever worked for. It's when, like Jonah, Jonah was about to lose everything that he had, was he not? God said, go to Nineveh. Jonah said, I will not. God said, oh, yes, you will. He went the other way. It got so bad that they threw him overboard, and God prepared a great fish. Three days and nights in the belly of a whale, you can't get to Nineveh fast enough. What I am telling you is this. It wasn't until he got into the belly of the whale and prayed to God that he saw the throne room of Almighty God from the bottom of the sea in the belly of a whale. Sometimes it takes us losing everything we've ever had and getting the lowest that we have ever been. It's called rock bottom that we finally get to the place where we're willing to look up and look for the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't worried about nothing else in his life. He saw the throne room of God and he said if I can ever just get to where that God is right there, I'll preach anywhere he ever tells me to preach he preached the revival the whole country got saved and the whole country repented of their sins what God is trying to tell you sometimes he has to take everything we've ever had away from us until we've got nothing else to hang on to but God because if we let things get between us and God he won't have it I'm about done I think even old David said, if I make my bed or my table in hell, God will be there. Do you remember that time David took those rejects and 400 of them showed up in a cave? I mean, they was unwanted. They was unwilling. They, had, they wasn't accepted by their own countrymen. They'd run them out of, the, out of the every village they ever got. And you had David and 400 other people that was, they considered worthless. Nobody wanted anything to do with. You'll never amount to nothing. And it may be a bunch of rejects that went into the cave. But may I tell you that it was the king and the greatest king that ever ruled Israel up to Jesus Christ. And it was it mighty men is who left out of that cave. Sometimes God has to get us in a cave in order to turn us into who he wants us to be. Sometimes adversity, trials, and tribulations is the best thing for us. Let me just go ahead. 
I'm telling you, Jesus Christ, was it not when he died, laid his life down, nobody took it, that the Bible says he went to the lower part of the earth? And him going to death from a God that could not die and to the death and the death, it set the captives free in Abraham's bosom. But he padlocked hell, and guess what? Men, you can't get there. There's a no entrance for you and for me. But not only that, but he took them to heaven with him. I'm telling you, for the people that suffer the most for the cause of Christ here upon this earth, heaven is going to be the sweetest for you. Because you'll appreciate it even more. I don't know about a faith where nothing ever goes wrong. I just don't know about serving Christ in this wicked world when everything goes smooth and it's just right and you don't never have a problem. I'd be checking something. The TV preachers will tell you if you got enough faith, you'll never have a bad day. I'm telling you by the Word of God, you're going to have bad days and the closer you walk with Him, the more bad days you're going to have. Let me just finish. I am so, I, I don't, yeah, I'm about done nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you know what the church is having to deal with now in a big way? I ain't making this up. Aliens. The government's got involved. They're turning loose classified documents where they saw spaceships and aliens. And had NASA specialists, I don't even know what kind of a degree they hold anymore. Now they're thinking that aliens come and left some of their stuff on the moon. But it wasn't moon pies. <laughs> I'm just saying that the devil and the wicked are going to introduce something that's not of this world to convince us that, number one, aliens created life. You see, they ain't having a whole lot of, they ain't having a whole lot of success with this Big Bang Theory like they once did. People's kind of figured, you know, it couldn't have happened like that. They got smart. So now they're saying it's of a design of aliens. And one guy wrote a book that said it was aliens and monkeys. So now, if any other creature gives you a convincing argument, and we can raise our kids in the house of God to believe God created, they can get to some college like Berkeley or some of them out in there. Now, they're going to teach them because they're all atheists. And the fact is, there is no God. God didn't create anything. It had to be aliens. And there is a big push because they're called ancient aliens is what taught them how to build the pyramids out in the middle of a desert. That's how they learn how to do everything. Aliens. I wish I was making this up. False gods and false idols abound in the day we live in. But it's God. I am quitting right there. Here's what I'm telling you. Whatever you're going through, if you would, let's get a verse of invitation. I always like to have invitation. And the fact is, there is so much out there that's trying to do one thing, is take you away from Jesus Christ. Trying to convince you and me Jesus is not the only true Savior. And the thing about it is, is there's so many institutions and experts out there that they can't get us or trying to convince our kids and grandkids that Jesus ain't the Jesus of their parents and grandparents. And they're trying to use scientific evidence to prove it. We're living in that time where creatures are being introduced to our kids as an alternate way. And if you've got scientific evidence that proves it in their mind, it's awful hard, is it not, while we stand our feet.